Formula One is the biggest and most prestigious motorsport in the world. Every team's budget is in the millions, and every car is engineered with the highest tech available. Their drivers are treated like celebrities with multi-million dollar contracts. But that wasn't always the case. You see, back then, Formula One was very different. For starters, they had the FISA, which was a subsection of the FIA and ran Formula One almost to its grave on many instances because it was biased towards the three manufacturer teams at the time, which were Ferrari, Renault, and Alfa Romeo. On the other side of the pond, you had the FOCA, which represented everyone else. During the late 70s and early 80s, the division between these two groups grew larger by the minute because policy and penalty bias aside, the revenue sharing from Formula One was heavily unbalanced in the big three's advantage. This caused many attempts of gaining and taking away control by both sides, from a boycott that ended with the intervention of the actual King of Spain to a failed Formula One spin-off and many other standoffs over the years. But this feud reached its heights when the big three brought turbos into the equation because the FOCA teams couldn't afford them and they were stuck with their naturally aspirated engines, putting them at an instant disadvantage. And as the turbocharged engines became faster and more powerful, they also became heavier. So the manufacturer teams lobbied FISA to bump up the minimum weight requirements to 585 kilograms. This was like a death sentence for the FOCA teams, since abiding by this rule meant they had to add weight to their cars which were already slower than their turbocharged competitors. This left them with two options. They were either going to spread their legs and drop the soap, or they would try to dig their way out of this hole. As you can imagine, they decided to grab a shovel, and they dug through the F1 rulebook, hoping to find any loophole which would put them back into competition. And sure enough, they did. Their creative new solution was water-cooled brakes. But wait, that doesn't really make your car faster, does it? No, but they weren't using them to cool their brakes. They were using them to dump weight. Let me explain. The rulebook said that all coolant must be present during the weight check, but it didn't specify whether the coolant had to be present for the entirety of the race, meaning they could fill their cars up with water in the pits for the weight check and then slowly release it on the track to make their cars lighter. And since the post-race weight checks required the cars to be topped up with their fluids, they could legally refill the water tanks and be at the required weight. And when the Brazilian Grand Prix came around, cars with the water-cooled brakes showed their dominance, when Nelson Piquet and Kiki Rosberg finished first and second, with the turbocharged Renault of Alan Prost finishing third. Immediately after the race, Renault protested the top two finishers on the grounds of breaking the weight requirement policy. In response, FISA disqualified Piquet and Rosberg. Both of the disqualified teams filed for appeals soon after, which caused a lot of debate in F1, especially between the manufacturer teams and the FOCA teams. But as usual, the FIA appeals took a long time to get resolved, so Ferrari decided to help the FIA with their decision. When the United States Grand Prix rolled around, Ferrari showed up with two wings on their cars. And even though their wings were twice the legal size, it was still technically legal because the rulebook only specified the size of the rear wing and not how many wings you can have. They ended up finishing second and third, and naturally, they were protested and later disqualified. This was a genius move by Ferrari because they knew damn well that everyone would cry about it and they would get disqualified, but they also knew that this would influence the Court of Appeals into denying the notions of the Williams and Brabham teams. The thought process they wanted to put inside the FIA's head was, if one loophole is allowed, then all loopholes are allowed, which would make it a regulatory shit show. And it worked! The FIA denied both appeals and FISA changed the post-race weight check rules to have the cars weighed in race condition without topping up the fluids, making cars fitted with water-cooled brakes underweight and essentially illegal. But FOCA wasn't going to let this slide, so at the San Marino Grand Prix, they staged a boycott in which all the aligned teams decided to skip the event in solidarity against FISA's handling of the sport but some teams broke their promise and competed anyways, citing sponsor obligations that they needed to fulfill. And the result was a 14-car race in San Marino, from which the Renaults of both Alain Prost and René Arnault retired with reliability troubles, allowing for a dominant Ferrari 1-2, which had its own controversy around it. The diminished grid undoubtedly had its negative impacts on FISA's image. 
How can a series claim to be the pinnacle of motorsports when over half the grid boycott events in protest of its management? An issue which, if persisted, would damage the finances of the sport and the love of its fan base. At least that was Foca's argument to the TV broadcasters. But in reality, this boycott was more or less a failure for Foca because there were still over 100,000 fans in the stands. Also, right after the Brazilian Grand Prix, the Foca teams met up and decided to end this feud because in the long run, they would lose way too much money with the sponsors threatening to leave and the fines they had to pay. This was the end of the multi-decade war. This also shaped Formula One to become the sport we love today. Because without the feud between FISA and FOCA, F1 teams would be underfunded and they wouldn't be able to compete and the drivers wouldn't be as well paid as they are today.